Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. I'm Jonathan Farrow, along with Lisa Abramowitz and Anne-Marie Hordern. Join us each day for insight from the best in markets, economics and geopolitics. From our global headquarters in New York City, we are live on Bloomberg Television weekday mornings from 6 to 9 a.m. Eastern. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify or anywhere else you listen. And as always, on the Bloomberg Terminal and the Bloomberg Business app. A slew of Fed speak on tap this week. We'll hear from Williams, Harker and Cook today. There are six more speakers tomorrow, plus retail sales data. On Thursday, more Fed speak, plus housing starts and jobless claims. Neil Richardson of ADP writing this. Jobs aren't everything. Labor market data has been decent news, but as the Federal Reserve takes a wait-and-see approach on interest rates, we see big changes afoot on pay. Neela joining us now. And Neela, what I love is you can dig beneath the data at a time when it has been so confusing. Can you give us a sense of just sort of the sea changes under the hood that might be warping some of the overall index levels that we're tracking? Sure. Well, good morning. It's great to be with you all today. I think what's interesting about this moment is that this is the most poked and prodded economy that I've ever seen. Every data point seems live and important, but it's not, it's sometimes a cacophony. And what we're looking at at ADP, we're going through to what we think is most important in this economy, which is how companies hire and what they pay. And that has changed significantly over the last four years. We've seen shifts in geographic distribution, so people are commuting long distances. That has an effect on pay. In fact, we find in our latest report, it's out today, that people who actually go the distance for employment make 16% more than people on their own teams. So that's a huge change, and it's under-examined in this market. We're seeing pay distribution change, the gaps between the wealthiest in workers and the lowest paid workers has grown by our estimate five percentage points over the last four years. We're seeing occupational changes where software developers, which should be an in-demand job with all of this talk about AI, there are fewer software developers now than in 2018. And then, of course, for all of us who have teenagers, summer hiring is in focus. The summer looks strong in terms of jobs, but not so strong in terms of pay for these young people. So all of these shifts feed into the narrative and the distribution of the worker, not something we talk about a lot. Lately. And I guess that's part of the reason why the data has been confusing, because there are these structural shifts that doesn't necessarily show itself on a headline level. So what do we do? with the data then? Should we just ignore it? Should we discount it because things are different and what it's telling us isn't really what's happening under the surface? We can't discount it because we know that a certain really important institution is pegging a certain really important decision on the cacophony of data points. But that one move won't shape the economy. Whether you lower interest rates by one uh, down to uh, one dip this year, 25 basis points or two or three, really won't change the distribution of the U.S. workforce, which has shifted. And I think that's what we're seeing in the data. That pay change, this low level of wage growth that was really keeping the economy on track during the 10 years of expansion is not here now that pay is changing, it's evolving, and that involvement in pay means that inflation may go up, may be higher for longer, and the Fed has always has to be watchful on the state of point, and on pay in particular. Consumer sentiment did not look good on Friday, and the director of the survey had this to say, the views of middle-income consumers resemble those of their lower-income counterparts, a departure from historical patterns in which their mentions are squarely in between those of higher and lower-income consumers. So what are you saying is that the wage gains gains are not on par with the inflation that middle and lower income individuals are feeling? You know, what they're seeing is price levels. And they're looking at, yes, their paychecks, but they're looking at what's in their basket at the grocery store. And as long as there's a disconnect between how much they're 
take home pay has grown and how much their uh, basket has shrunk, uh, they're always going to be a little moody. Now, we've seen that a moody, bad vibes on the consumer side does not necessarily translate to lower retail spending. That's going to be something to watch this week. Last April, retail spending was flat. Those vibes have crept in. How long, how permanent they are, whether they affect spending is going to be really important. We've seen some resilience in the consumer. I would argue from the high-end consumer. They have been carrying this economy. So it's a really interesting situation what, that we're seeing in the, in the pay when you take the pay and the retail side together. What you're seeing is that firms are raising prices because they have to increase pay for all those double-digit pay gains they've seen from low-paid workers. But the people who've actually benefited the most are high earners from asset prices, from higher wage gains. And so you have this like combination, this cohabitation. I was, <laughs> trying well to it well I was really trying to work it, it. <laughs> Between high spending, high earners, and low-income workers who are seeing high pay growth but not able to spend the same rates because of higher price levels. I'm glad that you brought that up, Anne-Marie, that survey that came out and the commentary from what we got from the University of Michigan survey. It kind of raised alarm bells for me because it's atypical. Usually what you see is that middle income workers kind of are in the middle when it comes to how they feel relative to the high end and the low end. They're not this time. They're shifting to the low end and it raises this question. It's been the big question for a lot of people. Are we seeing the beginning of a shift downward that's going to be a more protracted protracted weakening in the labor market. Are you seeing that? Is this a problem for you that whatever it is, you can't reject people's feelings en masse, and so there's something going on that's going to potentially have a significant impact on the economy? Feelings do translate into behavior. That's why we measure them. That's why they're important. And if you're seeing a, a diffusion a bad vibes, I'll, I'll label it that way, <laughs> Very bad formal. vibes through the income distribution. It doesn't spell good news for the economy. When I hear, what I hear from Main Street is I'm delaying. I'm being like the Fed. I'm going to watch. I'm going to watch before I take on that new lease in my new car. I'm going to watch before I buy that investment property, that rental property. So that waiting and watching has an effect on the economy. So even if you can afford to spend, you may not do it this quarter because you're waiting. So this is sort of the divergence between the bulls and the bears. Some people, I'm thinking of Andrew Hollenhorst out there, is thinking this is the beginning of a real weakening that we're going to see in the labor market. Last week's climb in initial jobless claims was a harbinger of a greater degree of weakening under the hood. Do you see that? No. I think, again, that goes back to my comment about this economy being prodded a little bit. This is a normal economy. You're not going to make straight A's every quarter. You're going to have some weakness here and there. There's going to be weakness in pockets, but that doesn't mean that it's a persistent diffusion. What, what we're trying to figure out, and it's a hair-trigger decision, is when the Fed can feel comfortable cutting rates. That doesn't mean the economy is bad because they start cutting it. It doesn't mean it's necessarily good because they start cutting it. I think what it means is that the Fed as a whole, collectively, feels that they're a little more restrictive than they want to be in this particular normalizing economy. So feeling better about the vibe session, maybe. <laughs> but, okay, one of this idea, again, not to harp on this, but this idea of all of a sudden everybody's feeling a lot worse in the middle income consumer too. Jim Bianco, in looking at that UMich data, basically looked at it and said, there's been something strange happening with it. It's actually democratic opinion that has really turned. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you look at it and say the same thing. Maybe what's actually happening is that political bias, but it's this huge cohort saying, maybe Trump is going to be elected. So it's still that political influence, but on the other side, too. It's hard to tell at this stage. We know that that MISH survey has had a methodological change, too. It's gone online. We don't know if that changed the sample. We've seen, though, for the past two months, pretty downbeat sentiment. I'd be hesitant, though, given the changes that we've seen on the methodological end, to... to uh, put too much on the mm. political differences right now, but we know that politics does affect opinion, does affect vibes on the economy, and we'll see and should track how that plays out over the course of the next six months for sure. Neela Richardson of ADP and a Bloomberg Television contributor, thank you so much for being with us as always. Looking forward to next time.
of CFRA also looking closer at the tech trade, saying this, even though six sectors also advanced, the tech sector was the exclusive outperformer last week, causing one to wonder just how long this can keep, can this jumbo jet keep flying on only one engine? Sam joins us now, and Sam, I have to say, this in some ways is the quote of the morning to me, given the fact that this is the ultimate existential question. Is this U.S. stock market ultimately incredibly vulnerable because of the dominance of the big tech names, or is it incredibly resilient because of that? Is it a feature or is it a bug? What do you think? Well, Lisa, good morning. I think that it is resilient. However, I do believe that we are headed for a second decline of 5% or more uh, in this year. Uh, good news is, however, that based on my historical work, every one of those top 15 first quarters ended up with a gain for the entire year, even though many of them went through two intra-year declines of 5% or more, and those average annual increases exceeded 20%. But when I look to the s and P500, I see it trading at a 32% uh, premium to its average 20-year PE. I look at tech at a 68% premium, and I look at tech at a 21% premium on a relative PE basis. I, I do sort of wonder if we've jumped, gone too far too fast and need to reset the dials in order to maintain this longer-term upward trajectory. So basically, you're saying that you think that tech is going to pull back a bit as the rest of the index maybe just uh, hovers around where it is now and that's what's going to drive uh, the index level 5% lower. Is that what I'm hearing from you? Well, I'm saying it's going to decline by at least 5%. Actually, history would say that we're probably going to experience a mild correction. So that 4,800 level on the S&P, I don't think is out of the question at this point. Um, I think that if we do start to see people take some profits in tech, it's not going to be just tech alone. Tech and consumer uh, communication services uh, are the only two sectors that are outperforming the S&P. Since we had about 68 percent of the S&P 1500 sub-industries trading above both their 50 and 200-day moving averages, today that number is down to 38 percent. So while the market has been advancing, it's really being led by tech and to a much lesser extent, communication services. Sam, it's been a long time since we've seen a 5% more or decline in this U.S. stock market. It's been a long time since we've seen a 2% decline in this stock market. It is, as Bank of America once called it, the Pavlovian urge to continue to buy because stocks keep going up. What needs to change? Because valuations alone haven't spooked investors. So what changes that allows for that sell-off to happen? Sure. Well, we did experience a 5.5% decline from March 28th through April 19th, and we recovered everything we lost uh, by mid-May, which is not surprising because of the 64 declines of 5 to 10% since World War II, it took us only a month and a half to get back to break even. So that's why I typically say that uh, you're better off not allowing your emotions to drive your portfolio decisions. Uh, but as we saw last time with the 10-year yield creeping higher, causing investors to worry about where it would end up peaking. Also, the worry about the Fed not likely to cut interest rates three times, as the March dot plots had indicated. Uh, most recently, expectations were for two, yet I found that investor ebullience was dashed by the dots this time around, with the expectation now only being at one. So uh, I think the question is, how long will the Fed maintain higher for longer, and does that increase Increase the risk of recession. You talk about in your note this frustration by the Fed and people could have been humbling the meatloaf song, two out of three ain't bad. What are you expecting this week then from all the Fed speak? Do you expect them to be a bit more dovish given the fact that the data potentially may mean they're going to cut before December? Well, Neil Kashkari's comments, uh, I think, were uh, basically what he's been saying for a while, which is much more of a hawkish tone. Uh, other commentary could, yes, take the other side as well, because the Fed wants to remind us that they are uh, data dependent. At the same time, I think they want to let us know that they are independent of political pressures. Every election year since 1992, except 2012, had the Fed either raise or lower interest rates in that election election year, and many times it occurred in September. So uh, I don't think the Fed would be averse to cutting rates if they felt that the data supported it. And you still think September remains in play. What's your biggest conviction for that? 
Uh, well, when I look to the CME uh, forecast model, uh, I see that uh, we're looking at one third or you know, a 38 percent in a sense, uh, indicating that we're probably going to stay at that current level. But obviously, 62 percent are implying that we will probably see a cut in September of either 25 or 50 basis points. That moves up to 80 uh, percent for the July period and even higher for September. I'm I'm sorry, for uh, December. So I would tend to say that the chances are increasing that we do end up seeing a cut uh, sometime this year with possibly two still on the table. Sam, a lot of people would agree with you. Last week, we saw a massive rally in U.S. government debt. I'm looking at a 21 basis point decline in 10-year yields down to 4.22 percent to end the week. Why is, that why is that not igniting a rally in some aspects of the risk market that have not participated? I'm thinking of small caps in particular. Well, I think first off, the reason that uh, one reason why the uh, yields have been coming down is because the prices have been going up because interest rates look more attractive here in the U.S. than in overseas. So that's attracting foreign investors. Uh, we certainly are looking at small caps now trading at a 31 percent discount on a relative P.E. basis, mid caps at 25 percent discount. I think it's because investors want to wait until the Fed does actually cut rates because of the potential of a rising risk of recession, since these smaller and mid-cap firms are the ones that will take it on the chin more so than large caps, should we end up having something deeper than simply soft landing? So uh, I think investors are, are playing it close to the vest at this point and focusing almost exclusively on the larger cap growth universe. Sam Stovall of CFRA, thank you so much. Right now, we want to dive into what to expect for the remainder of the year and whether the balance of risks has shifted as we do see a disinflationary tilt to more of the data, at least, in the United States. Joining us now, Stephen Major of HSBC and Lydia Basur of EY, both with us. Lydia, I want to start with you in terms of what you make over the rally that we've seen in bonds over the last couple of weeks in particular and what this signals about where the balance of risk is at a time when the Fed kind of had a hawkish tilt last week. Yeah, so um, we've seen a softening in economic data, and I think that the narrative has been shifting towards uh, the economy slowing more than what was, uh, you know, anticipated earlier this year when inflation surprised on the upside. Um, so what we're seeing in terms of the economy is a gradual slowdown in economic activity. Um, the Fed, um, you know, last week uh, was, you know, somewhat, you know, slightly hot, more hawkish than expected. Coming out of this meeting, there is really this sense that um, they have lost some conviction that inflation is moving back sustainably towards uh, the two percent target. So now, when we look at you know the next couple of um, months and and the coming data that we were discussing, it's all going to be about rebuilding that confidence, seeing less um, that softening in sequential inflation, uh, but also seeing some softening in the labor market uh, for the Fed to be confident enough to start cutting interest rates. Stephen, what did you make of last week, considering that we saw a hawkish tilt to the Fed, and yet you just reconfirmed in your mid-year outlook a belief in a rip-roaring rally in U.S. government bonds that could potentially take the 10-year yield to 3.5 percent? Yeah, I'm quite glad we kept the, the bullish conviction. Uh, the, the, I mean, the news flow coming through on the back of these elections that you were talking about in the in the prelude to this uh, interview, I, th I think that really matters, and I think it, it kind of overwhelms the impact of the CPI and payrolls releases and the Fed speak. So uh, I, I think it was yourself or or Danny that, that spoke about chaos, and you both mentioned France and Mexico. Uh, there's a lot of commonality here. The, 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 these are spread markets that have a lot of uh, overseas uh, or non-resident buyers behind them, and they don't respond well to volatility shocks. In this case, you've had election results that have brought the fiscal uh, challenges back into focus, and bonds don't like that. So if you get a flight to quality, people move from French bonds to German bonds, from Mexican bonds to U.S. bonds, and, and globally, it's all um, knocking on. And I think you've got an unwind going on of all these carry trades. So at a time of tight credit spreads, uh, and a bit of a vol shock, 
it's no surprise that Treasuries are doing quite well. Stephen, though, what happens when all of that meets U.S. political instability? If we do see something in November that looks like uncertainty about the results, confusion about the yeah. results, confusion about the policy, where does that money go? Yeah, I, I guess at the start of the year, everyone was focused on how many elections there were going to be this year. It's taken till the, half, the halfway point, Danny, for there to be a significant shock because... I mean, the Indian result wasn't a big shock in a way, and it is a very domestic market. The reason Mexico and France matter is because they're so international. So, so the U.S. election is still a long way away. And um, I, th I think everyone who's watching this show knows that there's a lot of debt, and they know what the policies are of the, of the two uh, presumed candidates. So um, it's not like there's a big unknown out there. Uh, it seems to me that part of the reason the data is, co is cooling is because the fiscal impulse is starting to fade. And I think all of us should just recognise whoever's the president in 2025 is going to have double the debt stock of eight years ago. So whoever's there is going to be somehow um, uh, restricted in, in what can be done in terms of, of future fiscal loosening. Uh, I don't think the US, by the way, is in that bad shape fiscally. Uh, I'm, I'm talking here about relative to other countries and considering the asset base. Uh, the growth of GDP has, been, has really helped. Uh, but of course, if the economy is cooling and the debt keeps going up, then, then you have more challenges. But uh, I, I don't think the US Treasury market should be so worried about the, about the debt. Lydia. What about from an economist's point of view? If we do have, it doesn't matter who's in, we know what the fiscal situation is, what the debt looks like, a fiscal impulse that fades, does it matter? Do we need to start worrying about the deficit? Yeah, I mean, we all can agree that, um, you know, the fiscal policy is on a unsustainable trajectory. Uh, when we look at interest payments on the debt, they've risen, you know, to 3% of GDP, which is uh, double the, the pre-pandemic rate. Now, I don't think, um, you know, this is threatening the outlook in the short run, but it does pose economic challenges in the long run. It pushes interest rates higher, can generate inflation, can, you know, wait on growth. And then more importantly, it also means that there is, you know, more limited fiscal space in, in the event of a downturn. Stephen, when you say that the U.S. doesn't look so bad, is that because relative to what is going on in the rest of the world that the U.S. doesn't look so bad? Or is it because you actually think the U.S. is okay when it comes to its fiscal trajectory? Yeah, a combination of, of both. I, 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 I don't know whether this is an English or American saying, but we call it the uh, least dirty shirt. So I sort of imagine looking through my wardrobe and trying to find the cleanest, brightest white shirt to wear. It's, it's a bit like that in that the U.S. Uh, debt stock as a percentage of GDP, if you look at the total debt, total debt, that's public and private sector, uh, since the, the 2008 uh, financial crisis, it, it's gone up, but it hasn't gone up as much as some other countries. And it's also been helped in the U.S. by the fact that the household has delevered. So, so um, uh, on a relative basis, it looks not so bad, and on a historical basis, it's okay. And uh, and I think the part of the factor is is the strength of the GDP and the tax take. Now, looking forward, the the, the U.S. has incredible taxing ability, but as we know, it's all a question of willingness. And it's also a question of policy. You know, we have a new report out today talking about the fact that if Trump's proposal to exempt tips, for example, from taxation, it would be $150 billion to $250 billion added to the federal, federal budget deficit. Is it very difficult to think about 2025 until we know, Stephen, the outcome yeah. of November? Or are you just expecting there's going to be a lot more um, debt added to the U.S.? I, I, I think the. The, the, that, that's a big number you just put out there. But there's also going to be money coming in the, on the other side because don't forget there's money from tariffs, for example. I mean, I, I mean we, we just don't know 
what the outcome is going to be. And it all depends on whether we have a sweep or not, because I think the fiscal outlook will very much depend on, on whether either candidate wins with a sweep. So so it, it's it, it's tricky. And I, and, I, and I think in terms of probabilities, um, at the moment, you, you, you wouldn't go down a baseline or base case of there being fiscal irresponsibility. I think that that is a, it is a risk. It's a scenario, but it's not the baseline. And, and, at, the, and yeah, at the moment, um, I look at U.S. Treasuries and I think that they're priced appropriately given where the policy rate is. If the policy rate starts coming down, yields are going to fall, and they're going to fall quite fast. That's what really matters. Bond yields don't go up because there's a lot of supply. And it seems that some people want to inject additional term premium into Treasuries because of the supply. I think it's already there. You can already see it. Lydia, do you agree? Yeah, I mean, looking at, um, you know, the elections and what the implications could be for the economy, um, there is a lot of uncertainty uh, surrounding, you know, the post-election landscape. Uh, when we look at um, the economic impact, we really focus on two key themes uh, that will be very important. The first one is fiscal policy, uh, but, you know, the, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act in particular and the expiration of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, uh, that's going to be an important um, issue and, you know, can represent a fiscal, a mini fiscal cliff. We've estimated it could, you know, shave one percentage point of GDP. Um, there is also what's happening on the trade front uh, with the potential for, um, you know, escalation in tariffs. We are already in an environment where inflation is still elevated. So seeing, you know, more inflationary impulse um, and, you know, potentially some hit to growth uh, would not necessarily be a desirable environment we want to be in, um, especially as the Fed embark on, on that easing cycle. We're talking with Stephen Major of HSBC and Lydia Basur of EY, both of you at a time when you're talking about yields going lower in the face of disinflation, as well as the U.S. just being a haven for a lot of dollars. Lydia, at what point do lower yields boost the economy, boost the economic activity in the United States and have a self-reinforcing cycle versus indicate some weakness that actually would be negative for the growth prospects? Yeah, I mean, when, um, when we look at the economy today, we're looking at um, an economic slowdown underway. We've seen some rebalancing in the labor market, market some softening uh, in labor market indicators. We're looking at consumers being more cautious with their spending investments, also uh, softening and companies being uh, more discerning with their, with their spending and hiring uh, because, you know, of this, you know, tighter um, credit condition environment and because consumer demand has softened and consumers are more price sensitive. So in this economic environment, with signs of softening in the labor market, um, we're expecting to see that recalibration in monetary policy happening you know, um, towards you know, September. We're expecting the first rate cut in September and rates starting to gradually move lower and move away from that restrictive policy stance. And you know, by you know, seeing that um, those, those rates moving lower, we should, you know, ensure that the economy doesn't uh, slow down uh, materially. We're expecting to see growth falling below trend in the coming quarters, but we're not expecting to see a retrenchment in economic activity. And the fact that the Fed is going to embark on that easing cycle should allow for that cycle to continue and run through 2025. Stephen, what's your view on this? Because some people would say that this economy has been a lot less sensitive to rate hikes. Why would they be so sensitive to rate cuts? Yeah, that's a fair point. Um, so you have to be careful with this one because I, I, I think that uh, people are expecting just very modest rate cuts. And in fact, that's all conditioned by what the Fed's just told us in their dot plot. So um, I, I find a bit of an echo chamber around the mainstream forecasts because they're all basically one standard deviation from the Fed. It, 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 it strikes me that it's probably true that the economy isn't that sensitive to the rate cuts. But, but when the rate cuts come, I think they're probably going to be more than um, the market's pricing in. And, and that's exactly the point, that, that, that cutting by 25 basis points here or there isn't going to do anything. So, so when the economy is really cooling, and if unemployment is going up at a faster rate than the Fed's forecast, I think that, that, that could be um, a kind of scenario to, to think about. Then, then, then rates will be cut quite hard and fast. Also, Lisa, it's, it's, it's not just about the U.S. cyclical economic data. It's about the, it's about the structural factors, this huge stock of debt. It's about what's happening in China and Europe. 
And, and ultimately, U.S. rates just look out of line with everything else. Stephen Major of HSBC, Lydia Basur of EY, both of you, thank you so much on a week where we'll be talking a lot about the Fed and rates. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast, bringing you the best in markets, economics and geopolitics. You can watch the show live on Bloomberg TV weekday mornings from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. Eastern. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify or anywhere else you listen. And as always, on the Bloomberg Terminal and the Bloomberg Business App.